First, let's start with our invocation. So we'll just start with this story which we've done before, but it will have a special relevance today. There was once a very conceited king who wanted to prove to everyone that he was the greatest. And um, so he called all the wise men in his kingdom and asked <clears throat> who is greater, God or me? So the wise men were in a dilemma because if they said God, he would punish them because he didn't want to hear that anyone's greater than them. And they couldn't lie either. So what to do? So one of the wise men said, I'll give an answer. And he said, King, you're the greatest. So they all looked at him and he said, let me explain why. You are so great that you can banish anyone from your kingdom anytime. But God cannot banish anyone from his kingdom ever. So because you have the power to banish and God in his love for everyone cannot banish, you're greater. So this is really symbolic of us. Who is the king and who is the wise man and how is it relatable to us? The king is the ego. The king is the ego because somehow the ego wants to always show that it's the best. Nothing appeases the ego more than hearing that, yeah, you're my favorite. You are the best. 
you do this the best nothing pleases our ego more than that so ego is our surface mind and the deeper part of us is god so while the ego it's very easy to cut people out of our life you don't you are not according to my liking i'll banish you from my life but the god inside us cannot cut anyone out of the life because god knows that everyone's part of him to cut anyone out of your life is to cut a part of your body and god can do that so on our surface it's very easy for us to say this one is toxic i'm going to cut that person out of my life and you can do that but at a very energetic level how are you going to do that at an energetic level everyone's part of you you are part of everyone so and that's not really what the god inside you wants anyway god cannot banish anyone from the kingdom it's a different thing whether you choose to communicate with the person or not but in a inner space level to think that you can cut anyone out of your life is foolishness because we really can't cut anyone out of our life because everyone is god right because if some if energetically everything is one body but at an energetic level that person is also god yes so that's not trying to cut the god in him i'm trying to cut the woman in him actually is yeah but you can't separate the god and the woman they are a package one second supposing uh, you are a very evil person and you made my life difficult okay and i can decide that i no longer want you to be part of my life and i can decide it i don't want it so done now that sure. god everyone is part doesn't mean you have to literally be a part of me but you don't have to hate the person sure but hating is separate cutting someone off is separate and if life puts the person in your vicinity you should not have a wall as you don't have a there are certain situations where you don't have a choice to cut someone out of your life so as long as you have to deal you deal but once you no longer have to deal and you have a choice to cut someone off then and the point you is that no of course you can disagree with me i'm not saying i'm right i don't think we have the choice to really cut anyone out we can have a choice to not associate that's a choice but not associating is not cutting the person out of your life if the thought of the person still bothers you or makes you like that the person's anyway in you no but if you can actually cut someone off your you life you can't But listen, huh. if I hate you, huh. I, if supposing I no, I don't hate you, huh. but we are not getting along, mm-hmm. and then I have a chance to not associate with you anymore, and I'm fine. Like whatever happened, happened. Cool. Mm-hmm. It happened. I don't hate you anymore for it. I don't have any. So long as the thought with. of me doesn't make you feel yeah, what a horrible thing. Yeah, yeah. No, not out yeah. But just now, you go, you do your thing. I go do my thing. Yeah, but Tanu, fine, yeah? Tanu, I hate to say this. Life won't be so easy. Whatever is unresolved will always come back. Till you are completely at peace with the person, life will keep going. But if you person. are at peace, like what you did, you did. What happened, happened. Yeah. But now I don't want to associate with you more. So then, more doesn't keep happening. Sure. If fine, life yeah. allows you that, good. Yeah. Then if it allows you. <laughs> if it allows you that but in my experience still if something is resolved it will keep coming back in your life and once it's resolved can i cut you <laughs> <laughs> once it's resolved you may not want to cut me now you may not want to no but if it's resolved and okay I'm... tanu you but talk you about what i'm trying to say right i you understand what, what you're trying to say and for you just now fine go ahead with what you're doing but somewhere in the back of your mind keep what i'm saying in mind okay do you know i'm ready to resolve or i kind of agree with her huh. in reality that happens like if she is bringing negative energy in my life at some point in time i will break in my distance okay i don't want more quarrels with her let me sure go your way sure I but so long as system. in my inner space i'm not resentful towards her and i don't feel the need to run away from her But if I don't have the capacity to deal it, no, deal you it in the way. Sure, then take your ideal. distance ah, till you yeah. have the capacity to not run right. away. Okay. Ideally, that's the ideal, where yeah, I don't yeah. need to have a capacity. Yeah. 
It's not that the person is the most important in my life, but that beautiful line of Rudyard Kipling, if all men count with you, but none too much, and I will say none too little. You're okay. If you're there, I'm fine. I don't feel a recoil or I don't need to run away from you. Till you read. See, there's a beautiful thing Eknath Ishwaran has said. He's saying, bearing resentment towards anyone is more than one impaired relationship. It's cutting your connection to the whole. So, whatever a person does, that's their nature. But it's my choice what nature I want to follow. So, um, we started our talk with uh, the chant, Anandmai, Chaitanyamai, Satyamai, Parane. And uh, Anandmai means full of joy. So deep down, there is something in us, the God in us, which cannot banish anyone from his kingdom because he knows that everyone's part of him. That never loses its smile. Why does the king, the ego, want to banish people? Because it judges people as you are bad, you are this, you are that. But the God inside us knows that everyone is himself wearing a silly mask. So the God in us just smiles, whatever happens. And that's the beautiful prayer of the mother. It's on the first page. At the core, at the core of all that is, of all that will be, of all that is not, is thy divine and unchanging smile. The Anandmai at the core of everything, at the core of all that is, of all that will be, of all that is not, is thy divine and unchanging smile. That is the king inside me, that unchanging smile, who cannot banish anyone from his kingdom. The Divine Worker, it's a beautiful sonnet by Sri Aurobindo. I face earth's happenings with an equal soul in all, I heard thy steps, thy unseen feet, tread destiny's pathways in my front. I face earth's happening with an equal soul. When can I face earth's happenings with an equal soul? When I see that it's your hand in everything. When I see it divorced from you, I recoil, I'm afraid, I'm resentful. In all I heard thy steps, thy unseen feet, tread destiny's pathways in my front. Life's whole tremendous theorem is thou complete. You know what a theorem is in maths, right? It's something difficult to solve. But here he's saying life's whole tremendous the theorem, that difficult sum of maths, is complete in you. When I find you, that difficult sum gets complete. The difficult sum may be a person, a circumstance, but life's whole tremendous theorem is thou complete. No danger can perturb my spirit's calm. My acts are thine. I do thy works and pass. Failure is cradled on thy deathless arm. Victory is thy passage mirrored in fortune's glass. Why can no danger perturb my spirit's calm? Because I know that your hand is in every circumstance that happens in life. My acts are thine. I do thy works and pass. Failure is cradled on thy deathless arm. Uh, a baby is cradled on a mother's arm, right? And the mother keeps it safe. So my failure is like a baby cradled on your arm. You're looking after that failure so that it doesn't cry too much. Failure is cradled on thy deathless arm. Victory is thy passage mirrored in fortune's glass. In this rude combat with the fate of man, 
my life is sometimes a rude combat with fate, right? It's not very flattering, it's rude. In this rude combat with the fate of man, thy smile within my heart makes all my strength. Mother says, at the call of all that is, of all that will be, of all that is not, is thy divine and unchanging smile. So here he says, in this rude combat with the fate of man, thy smile within my heart makes all my strength. So let me think of some rude combat with fate that I've had. All of us have had it and many of them. And we felt weak, helpless, abandoned. But we had a choice to give in to that feeling or to turn to something within us and gain strength. So very beautiful on 17th November, there was a meditation here. And I put up the message on our Savitri group and one of the young girls had come here. And at about 8 o'clock when I came here to meditate because I couldn't come early on my way, I read a beautiful message she'd sent me. She said, I came and I sat and I was first telling mother all my troubles. I was telling her mother, help me with that. Mother, help me with this. And I was feeling very selfish because I was not uh, thinking of her on her Mahasamadhi day. I was only thinking of myself and my problems. And then I don't know, something within me said, first find peace in yourself. She said, I heard a voice saying, find peace find peace in yourself and then somehow by itself thoughts were coming but I could see through the thoughts there was a peace inside holding me and I could just see through all the thoughts and they were not bothering me and she said she must have come I don't know she said till now I'm feeling the peace so when we are with the king the ego there are only problems there are only enemies the ego actually survives on seeing enemies. The more it sees enemies, the more separate it feels. And its survival is based on feeling separate, right? But that voice inside will not see enemies and problems. It will see oneness and joy and fulfillment. And no matter what we are going through, we always have the choice of connecting with that smile within and drawing the peace. I mean, nobody had to tell this girl. She just sat and that voice inside her said, stop all this dialogue about problems. First, find peace inside yourself. That's the most important thing. And then it guided her to find that peace. So, and this guidance is there within each of us always. But if we keep seeing enemies and problems, we won't look for that peace which is inside us. So, no danger can perturb my spirit's calm. My acts are thine. I do thy works and pass. Failure is cradled on thy deathless arm. Victory is thy passage mirrored in fortune's glass. In this rude combat with the fate of man, thy smile within my heart makes all my strength. Thy force in me labors at its grandiose plan, indifferent to the time snake's crawling length, to the king, to the ego, to the surface being, it can look like time is crawling. I'm getting impatient. Why aren't results coming? Why am I not getting what I want? But Sri Aurobindo is assuring me that Thai force, God's force in me labors at its grandiose plan. It has a plan for me, but I can't see it. Thy force in me labors at its grandiose plan, indifferent to the time snake's crawling length. No power can slay my soul. It lives in thee. Thy presence is my immortality. 
Nothing can slay my soul because it lives in you. And your presence is my immortality. Now this is not part of the screen share. But uh, on the Savitri group, some days back, I had posted. Let me read that. There was a beautiful picture of the mother. There was a beautiful picture of the mother and it reads, I am in every thought, every aspiration which you turn towards me. For if you were not always present in my consciousness, you would not be able to think of me. So beautiful. She's saying the moment you think of me, you're already in my consciousness. Because if you were not in my consciousness, it would not even be possible for you to think of me. For if you were not always present in my consciousness, you would not be able to think of me. So you may be sure of my presence. Even if I'm troubled and I'm able to think of her, I'm already in her consciousness. So these are beautiful aphorisms. There's a book, Thoughts and Aphorisms. If you haven't picked it up, do pick it up. It's marvelous. Very simple, very nice. It's available here. So aphorism 50, Sri Aurobindo's, to feel and love. So firstly, let me tell you, I've read this aphorism many times, but yesterday when I read it, I was stumped by the beauty of it. Like, we have many definitions of morality, you know? We feel to be moral is to do the right thing, to be virtuous. But in this aphorism, he gives a definition of morality which just stumped me. I've never come across a more beautiful definition of morality. To feel and love the God of beauty and good in the ugly and the evil, and still yearn in utter love to heal it of its ugliness and its evil. This is the real virtue and morality. Param, I was saying that I've never read a more beautiful definition of morality than this aphorism. To feel the God of love and beauty and good in the ugly and the evil. So we are saying, I hate you. You're ugly, you're evil, you're toxic. But to feel the love of God, to feel the, and love the God of beauty and good in the ugly and the evil. Now that's a huge challenge. How do we do it? You're here spitting venom. Everything in me is screaming that you're wrong. You're terrible. And my guru is telling me to feel the love, to feel and love the God of beauty and good in the ugly and the evil and still yearn in utter love to heal it of its ugliness and its evil. This is real virtue and morality. Now, how do you explain this? I'm seeing that you're toxic, you're terrible, you're everything. And the demand on me is to love the God in you and to have the discernment to know that, yeah, what you're doing is wrong, but not say you're wrong, get lost. To have it in me, to want to heal it, though everything wrong in you is attacking me. Not understanding. It's maybe not possible for all of us. We are all at different curves in evolution in our stage and maybe it's not possible for us but let me at least keep it as a goal at some point in future i do what's possible for me and accessible to me and available to me at this moment but sri aurobindo is obviously writing from what was accessible and obviously available to him where he was yes hmm. but isn't it that we shouldn't try to heal someone else like if you, you know when people get into relationships thinking I'll fix the other person and I'll heal it and that always goes I agree way. with you. That depends on where you are in your evolutionary curve. If that power to heal, don't even want to do anything to heal. 
but at least a desire, a goodwill that I wish this person heals. That I can do. A prayer that may you heal, may you come back to the God nature that you really are. That prayer is available to me. Because I mean, I personally have a thing that I don't, I mean, no matter what someone does or whatever, like, I wouldn't want to leave that person. But I mean, like, just no, physically, <laughs> physically leave the person. There are some people who are toxic for you. So, physically, space is good. But in your heart, you can always send that person. And don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to follow everything that's said in this class. Keep it somewhere as seeds. They may sprout at some point. Do be natural. Be what you are. Don't be conditioned into being artificial. I still have to say what I have to say. But you follow your inner wisdom and for, go from where you are at your evolutionary curve. So I just, yeah. Yes, the act is prakriti, it's nature, but it's not the being. The being is always God. So what you mean is to have that kind of eternal love for the being, but you can take the act and yeah. associate that with it. Yes, yes. Or you may not even have access to loving the person, yeah, but at least the memory good. that this is also God. And when I'm Another aphorism he writes so beautifully. He says, God struck me with a human hand. Should I say, oh God, I pardon thee thy insolence. Now, that's how he writes. God struck me with a human hand. Should I say to God, I pardon thee thy insolence. Now, I can't follow all this. If somewhere my background consciousness doesn't hold that all is God. Then it's senseless, it's stupid. But somewhere, if I make this my mool mantra, that all is God, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, then I will be self-protective. But I'll protect myself because I'm also God. The God here shouldn't be harmed. But nor do I have a will to harm the God there. Yeah? Not help, but I can pray for the person, right? I can, you know, it's one thing to say you're just all bad, get lost. I don't want to see you. And it's one thing to remember however bad the person is, the person has God in him and therefore has infinite potential to change. And I may not, it, I may not be able to deal with you right now or connect with you right now. But I can have a prayer in my heart that may the God in you flower when the season comes. This is, I mean, this one can reach my stage. But what I'm asking is, are we allowed to do it? I mean, Why not? Gods, but um, you are God. Why are you disconnect? You are also God. No, your thought is powerful. Every thought we have is so powerful because it's a thought of God. Why are we being weak? Of course, because this is also God. I have to look after the God here also and do what's best for the God here. Beyond that, I'm sometimes trying to interfere No, in action I will never interfere unless I really feel a command from within to interfere. Most of you who I interact with, I never interfere in your lives. But maybe if it comes to me, I'll pray for you. Or I'll even pray for the person who offends. Mother says it so beautifully. I intervene. I don't interfere. Most of us interfere and the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Our interference sometimes causes more damage than good. Further, he says, to hate the sinner is the worst sin, for it is hating God. Yet he who commits it glories in his superior virtue. You're unconscious, you're bad, I'm right in hating you. To hate the sinner is the worst sin, for it's hating God. Yet he who commits it glories in his superior virtue. 
when I hear of a righteous wrath, I wonder at man's capacity for self-deception. When I hear of a righteous wrath, I'm right in hating you. Sri Aurobindo says, I wonder at man's capacity for self-deception. This is a miracle that men can love God yet fail to love humanity. With whom are they in love then? Yeah, that's his question. You say you love God, but you hate human beings. Then who do you love? Okay. We take a detour from Sri Aurobindo. We come to this beautiful book called The Truth Is by Sri H.W.L. Punja, who has a beautiful ashram in Lucknow and his devotees lovingly call him Papaji. The scriptures speak of the three holy rivers within. These are existence, consciousness and bliss. Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat is truth, existence, Chit is consciousness, bliss is Ananda. They cannot be objectified or subjectified. There's no subject and object there. They are so dear, so near, behind the retina and before the breath. You need not see this. You are it. So Papaji is saying you are Satchit Anand, the three holy rivers within. That voice which told that girl, stop grumbling about your problems, first find peace within. That's the Satchidanand which is always guiding from within. They cannot be ob objectified or subjectified. They are so dear, so near, behind the retina. Take your finger in front of you. Come on, all of you do it. Bring it closer and closer and closer till it touches your Eye. then can you see it when it's touching your eyelash and your eye you can't see it so to see anything it has to be separate from you right but something that is so intricately you and one with your vision you can't see it so this presence this Satchidanand is so dear so near Behind the retina, it's behind your eyes, so you cannot see it. And before the breath, you need not see this. You are it. You are not different than existence, than being. See being everywhere by not looking. The more you look for God, the more you won't find it. Because God is part of your fabric. He's behind the retina. He's one with the vision. So it can't see, no? Everything is God and that's part of you. You are not different than existence, than being. See being everywhere by not looking. The seeing is being, not the object seen. Consciousness is the original mother. If you know this, she will take care of you and give you happiness, peace and deathlessness. So beautiful. This form is the mother, but in her formless aspect, she's consciousness. Consciousness is the original mother. If you know this, she will take care of you and give you happiness, peace and deathlessness. This mother we do not recognize and this gets us into trouble. The unknown is your nature. Return to that. Because the known will give you no lasting peace, no lasting love. Bliss is eternal. Even though it appears to arise when the mind dies. Bliss is not an experience. It is your nature. This is the heart of the wise. This gift is always calling to everyone. You are seated in the heart of all beings. This is the truth. Your face shines. Bliss is eternal, even though it appears to arise when the mind dies. When the thoughts die, you're already in a state of happiness. But even when the thoughts are there, behind the veil of thoughts, this smile, Mother says, no, behind all that is, 
all that will be, all that is not is thy divine immutable smile. That is the bliss. Bliss is not an experience. It's your nature. My nature is joy. This is the heart of the wise. This gift is always calling to everyone. You are seated in the heart of all beings. This is the truth. Your face shines. Now we come to words from Sri Aurobindo's Life Divine. In the first place, since in our depths, we ourselves are the one, since in the reality of the being, we are the indivisible, all-conscious, and therefore the inalienable, all-bliss, the disposition of our sensational experience in the three vibrations of pain, pleasure, and indifference, can only be a superficial arrangement created by that limited part of ourselves which is uppermost in our waking consciousness. So Sri Aurobindo is reinforcing that since in our depths we are the indivisible, we are already one with everyone, all consciousness and inalienable, we can't cut it out of ourselves, all bliss, the experience of pain, pleasure and indifference is only a superficial arrangement created by our surface mind. Behind, there must be something in us much vaster, profounder, truer than the superficial consciousness which takes delight impartially in all experiences. Can we even believe this? That deep down we have something that takes joy in every experience. Our, if we think of the most painful experience we've gone through, something in us will vociferously say no. There can't be when I was in so much pain. There could not have been any part of me which was taking delight in this experience, isn't it? And yet Sri Aurobindo argues, he's written this beautiful work in Sanskrit, Sri Aurobindo Upanishad, in that he argues that if there wasn't this ananda supporting us in moments of niranan, we would perish with the niranan. Sometimes human pain is so much that if there wasn't this all bliss in our depth supporting us as we went through the experience of pain, we would perish with the experience of pain. The very fact that we don't perish means there is this bliss supporting us. And the more we go within, the more it actually becomes possible to go through every experience with a smile in our heart. Yeah, it's possible. And that's our goal. Why is pain so powerful? Pain is so powerful because, uh, you know, it's proven that our memories of pain stick in our head like fevicol. But memories of joy are like Teflon. We forget them very fast. So we have a recoil towards pain. We don't want it. And whatever we resist persists. I've often told you this, M. Scott Peck's words, all neurotic behavior is a bit to avoid legitimate suffering. Suffering is legitimate because we'd never grow without pain. It's not that we should be sadistic and invite pain. But when pain comes, we shouldn't shout, go away, go away, go away. That's neurotic behavior. All neurotic behavior is a bit to avoid legitimate suffering. Suffering comes sit with it ask it what have you come to teach me because pain will never come without an intention to teach you something instead of hating the person who gives you pain better to ask what do i learn from it where can i grow from it so one very conscious person was telling me about a friend of hers who gave her a lot of pain and did things which 
really shouldn't have done and when she told me the whole episode i said yeah i mean this poor child hasn't done anything and so much poison thrown at her but she told me look i don't want you to reinforce where my friend has gone wrong i'm not interested in that i want you to hear my narrative telling me where i've gone wrong because if mother has said that whenever there's a quarrel both parties involved are wrong if we had a quarrel you tell me even that smallest bit where i've gone wrong i said wow that's conscious living normally when people complain to me they just want me to support them they want me to tell me tell them you're absolutely right she's a devil you should do this you should do that but look at this girl telling me don't support me and telling me where this person's wrong that's between her and mother tell me where i'm wrong then we could have a meaningful dialogue and in fact there was nothing to even tell her her wisdom had already said everything that needed to be said so uh the three variations of pain pleasure and indifference can only be superficial arrangement created by that limited part of ourselves which is uppermost in our waking consciousness behind there must be something in us much vaster profounder truer than the superficial consciousness which takes delight impartially in all experiences it is that delight which secretly supports the superficial mental being and enables it to persevere through all labor suffering and ordeals in the agitated movement of becoming that which we call ourselves is only a trembling ray on the surface behind is all the vast subconscious the vast superconscious profiting by all these surface experiences and imposing them on its external self which it exposes as a sort of sensitive covering to the contacts of the world its self veiled it receives these contacts and assimilates them into values of a truer profounder a mastering and creative experience out of its depths it returns them to the surface in the in forms of strength character knowledge impulsion whose roots are mysterious to us simply put he saying that what we call ourselves is just a trembling ray on the surface it's reacting with pain pleasure and indifference and whatever happens to us is actually assimilated by the superconscious in us the god in us churned and returned to the surface as strength compassion growth so it's a promise that not one drop of pain that you go through is futile every drop of pain that you grow go through is used by the deeper being and return to the surface as strength growth whatever else that's why m scott peck says that all neurotic behavior is a bit to avoid legitimate suffering the suffering is legitimate it needs to be there you are not suffering we often say this is so unnecessary why does he behave like this but nothing in life is unnecessary there's a meaning in every curve and line and really at one point we'll all reach a pain where we'll bless every moment of our life we won't say anything was futile we'll say thank you for every single moment of pleasure and pain and we'll say thank you out of our depths on bent knees because everything was worth it right now it's work in progress so there are some things which we say had have definitely been better off without it but so beautiful we all know that in the mahabharat draupadi was very fiery she was always spitting wrath and fire and wanting revenge and wanting to wash her hair with dushasan's blood and all that but when she died the story goes when the pandavas were going to heaven she reached a poor moment of total peace and reconciliation with everything in her life and she smiled and said ah now at last i understand 
that Draupadi had to go through everything that she went through. So she reached that moment of resolution where perhaps she could bless every moment of our life. So out of its depths, it returns them to the surface in the forms of strength, character, knowledge, impulsion, whose roots are mysterious to us because our mind moves and quivers on the surface and has not learned to concentrate itself and live in the depths. Why do we quiver? Why are we not able to smile at everything that life brings? Because we haven't learned to live in our depths. Our depths are anyway living with this immutable smile. In our ordinary life, this truth is hidden from us or only dimly glimpsed at times or imperfectly held and conceived this truth of the smiling presence in us. But if we learn to live within, we infallibly awaken to this presence within us, which is our more real self, a presence profound, calm, joyous, and puissant or powerful, of which the world is not the master. A presence which, if it is not the Lord himself, is the radiation of the Lord within. We are aware of it within supporting and helping the apparent and superficial being and smiling at its pleasures and pains as at the error and passion of a little child. So there is this being inside us which is always smiling and it's smiling at the surface being as if at the errors of a little child. Oh, now you got upset. Now you're angry. So it's just smiling all the time at the surface self. And if we can go back into ourselves and identify ourselves not with our superficial experience, but with that radiant penumbra of the divine, if we can live in that attitude towards the contacts of the world and stand back in our entire consciousness from the pleasures and pains of the body, vital being and mind, possess them as experiences whose nature being superficial does not touch or impose itself on our core and real being. In the entirely expressive Sanskrit terms, there is an anand mai behind the manomai. We've done the five koshas, na? the manomai kosh, the mental being. And behind that, there's the anand mai kosh, the bliss sheet. And the Taitiriya Upanishad says that the anand mai kosha is the soul of the manomai kosha. The bliss from behind supports the thoughts. Penumbra is a light shadow. In physics, a dark shadow is umbra. Penumbra is a light shadow. But with the radiant penumbra, the light shadow of the divine, it's called a penumbra because it's not a light yet to us seeing. It's just like a shadow on our consciousness, half lit, half dark. But with the radiant penumbra of the divine, we can live in that attitude towards the contacts of the world and stand back in our entire consciousness from the pleasures and pains of the body, vital being and mind. Possess them as experiences whose nature being superficial does not touch or impose itself on our core and real being. In the entirely expressive Sanskrit terms, there is an anand mai behind the manomai, a vast bliss self behind the limited mental self, and the latter is only a shadowy image. The surface is only a shadowy image and disturbed reflection of the former. The truth of ourselves lies within and not on the surface. 
So this is another saying of Sri Aurobindo and another delightful book. Those of you who love English, you love both these books, Thoughts and Aphorisms and Thoughts and Glimpses. What is God after all? An eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden. So beautiful. Who is God after all? An eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden. Did I? Yeah, I skipped it. You can read it on your way. So now we come to Savitri. All here where each thing seems its lonely self are figures of the soul transcendent one. Every thing here seems separate, but they are figures of the soul transcendent one. Only by him they are. His breath is their life. An unseen presence molds the oblivious clay. The oblivious clay, unknowing clay. Each of us is the unknowing clay. And we just discussed an aspect where this unseen presence is molding us. We say when we go through pain, that presence inside us, deep inside, uses those painful experiences, works with them and returns them to the surface as growth, compassion, whiteness, whatever. That's one way, but there are infinite ways the unseen presence molds the oblivious clay. A playmate in the mighty mother's game, one came upon the dubious whirling globe to hide from her pursuit in force and form. Each of us is a playmate in the mighty mother's game and we came upon this dubious whirling globe to hide from her pursuit in force and form. The master of being has come down to her. To her is Prakriti. In Shavitri, when you read it, she or her can be Prakriti. It can be the divine mother. It can be Savitri herself. So you have to look at the context and figure out the she is who. The master of being has come down to her. An immortal child born in the fugitive years. Fugitive is changing. So beautiful. Look at his play of words. An immortal child born in fugitive years. Years will change but the child remains immortal. The master of being has come down to her. An immortal child. The immortal child is the psychic being which is eternal. It never dies. A fugitive, an, an immortal child born in the fugitive years. In objects wrought, in person she conceives. Dreaming, she chases her idea of him and catches here a look. There a jest. Here the she is Prakriti, nature. Nature is always looking for God. Dreaming, she chases her idea of him and catches here a look, there a jest. Ever he repeats in them his ceaseless births. He is the maker and the world he made. He is the vision and he is the seer. He is himself the actor and the act. He is himself, the knower and the known. This is God. God is the maker and the world he made. So mother said, I never liked the term creation of God. I'd rather think God and his becoming because God has become creation. He is the maker and the world he made. He is the vision and he is the seer. He is himself, the actor and the act. He is himself, the knower and the known. He is himself the dreamer and the dream. So everything is God. The master of existence lurks in us. So God is hidden inside us and plays at hide and seek with his own force. Prakriti or nature is his force. And he is playing hide and seek with Prakriti. Why? Because he's showing himself sometimes then he's hiding. And 
if God is an eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden, if his game is this hide and seek, will a child hide if he doesn't want to be found? There's no fun in hide and seek in hiding if you don't want to be found, right? So the child God in each of us wants to be found. That's why he's playing this game of hide and seek. The master of existence lurks in us and plays at hide and seek with his own force. In nature's instrument loiters secret God. The imminent lives in man as in his house. He has made the universe his pastimes field, a vast gymnasium of his works of might. All knowing, he accepts our darkened state. So the, so the God in us is all knowing, but to play this game, he has to accept the limitation of our ignorance. I've told you this often that you can never play a game unless you put a limitation on yourself, right? For example, to play basketball, you have to put the limitation that I can't kick the ball, right? To play football, I have hands which can throw the ball, but I can't use my hands. So to play any game, you have capacity, but the rule of the game says that you limit your capacity. So although we are all, all knowing in our depths, to play the game, the Leela of life, we the all-knowing one inside us takes on our ignorance as part of the game. I have a question. Yeah? Isn't that implied that also like winners and losers? So in his game, everyone's a winner. Because, but don't take it literally. It's a, it's a different kind of game from a human game. So in his game, there are no losers because there are no others. In his game, it's God playing ball with himself. So who can win, who can lose? His game is designed that every manifestation of himself finally is a winner in the game of evolution. Uh, there's a line in Savitri, his failure is not failure whom God leads. And everyone is being led by God in their own growth curve. Yes, if he's playing the game with himself, does he not make him the winner and the loser? <laughs> yeah. It makes him the winner and the loser. And finally, in each embodiment, he'll emerge the victor. This lifetime, next lifetime, <laughs> 10 lifetimes later. But the Godhead in each embodied being is bound to win. So isn't that like evolution or whatever is complete when like every single person reaches the Stage. That's the supramental world when it comes. No, but that, does that mean that's what yeah. like every single human being, like today, yeah. however? So they are either Sri Aurobindo says either humans who are not equipped will sort of, yeah, will it's survival of the fittest, no? In Darwin's theory of evolution, so those who are fit for evolution, like the monkeys who weren't fit. They became extinct. The monkeys who were fit survived and finally became man. So the human monkeys who aren't fit will be left behind. <laughs> Rest of the human monkeys will go forward and some of them will evolve into the supramental age. So. <laughs> I can't answer that. I don't know. But that won't concern you anyways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, a vast gymnasium of his works of might, all knowing he accepts our darkened state, divine where shapes of animal or man, eternal he ascends to fate and time. Immortal he dallies with mortality. Dallies means plays. He's immortal, but he's playing with mortality. The all-conscious ventured into ignorance. The all-blissful wore to be insensible. So, okay. And there's one last page. He has made this tenement. Tenement is house. 
he has made this house of flesh. We are the house of flesh he inhabits. He has made this tenement of flesh his own. His image in the human measure cast. So in each of us is his image cast into human measure. That to his divine measure we might rise. Then in a figure of divinity, the maker shall recast us and impose a plan of Godhead on the bottle's mold, lifting our finite minds to his infinite, touching the moment with eternity. This transfiguration is earth's due to heaven. A mutual debt binds man to the supreme. So when God forgot himself and became us, he loaned himself to us. So metaphorically, it's a debt we owe to God. He loaned us our existence by becoming us. And we pay back that loan by becoming him. So that's the mutual debt. A mutual debt binds man to the supreme. There's a beautiful line from Rumi says, which I've said in the past. This is the voice of God talking. He said, since the beginning of the dream, this existence is like a dream, no? We don't know its reality. Since the beginning of the dream, in a manner so discreet, I've been dancing in your corpse. My love is so complete. Corpse. Because... Human being is lifeless without God's presence, right? So God's presence is dancing in us. They say, you know, the Shabba becomes Shiva because of Shiva in them. Shabba is a dead, dead a corpse. Shabba becomes Shiva because Shiva is inside the Shabba. Anyway, that's a play of words, shall we? So, uh, what it's a metaphorical way of saying that we would be nothing if God didn't become us. So God is telling us that since the beginning of the dream in a manner so discreet, so veiled, you never found out. You'll never even know this is my play and I'm present in you. Since the beginning of the dream in a manner so discreet, I've been dancing in your corpse. My love is so complete. I love you so completely that I've completely forgotten myself and I've become whatever you've allowed me to become. So God has lent us our existence by becoming us. Now we pay back that debt by becoming him. His nature we must put on as he put ours. Now don't take all this very literally. There's no, I mean, God loves us too much to really say you owe me and all that it's just a way for us to think to be motivated um, to pay back because we want to not because god demands anything from us god is one space which demands nothing from us but we want to pay back so a mutual debt binds man to the supreme his nature we must put on as he put ours. We are sons of God and must be even as he. His human portion, we must grow divine. Our life is a paradox with God for key. A paradox is opposites, right? But God is the key to everything. Let's go back to where we started. There's this person who's very toxic in my life. I want to cut away from the person. I want to banish the person from my life. Uh, but this person somehow, sometimes it's not a choice. The person is in my life and from some back door or the other keeps coming. So that's one paradox. I don't want this, but it's in my life. How do I resolve it? What's the key to the paradox? The knowing that all is God. If that person is also God and I completely understand that the God in that person won't allow that person to harm me more than what's good for my growth, 
then I don't need to fear or be defensive around the person. I may not trust the person, but I completely trust God, isn't it? So I'm just sharing today only I spoke to one student after the yoga class. It was her first class and she said that, you know, I'm very shattered because somebody I completely trusted totally let me down, leaked on me for his benefit. And I feel as if I can't trust any human being after that because I keep remembering that betrayal so much. So I told her what I say often in classes, what mother says that human beings are imperfect and they will let you down. Every human being will let you down at some point or the other. No human being is really for you. Only the divine is for you if you are for the divine. What does that mean actually? Divine is not separate from humanity, right? Now this is a paradox. Mother is saying human beings will let you down. And then she's saying in the next breath that only the divine is from, for you. But the divine is part of humanity, right? So the peace of the whole, W-H-O heli, will let you down. But the whole will never let you down. And this person, her whole face lit up and she said, I feel so light just knowing this, that the peace may let me down, but the whole will never let me down. The, the God in Bijal may do things to upset me today, but the God in Param will come along and support me. It's the same God in both playing with me slapping with me with this hand and holding me from that hand like a pot no when a potter is being made one hand of the potter is mercilessly banging the pot but the other hand of the potter is supporting the pot from within so whatever people do to you it's always sensible to trust because you're not trusting the peace you're trusting the whole the whole will never ever let you down. Okay? <laughs> so with that, let's sit quietly. If we can shut off the lights. So let's assimilate and summarize what we've done so we can practice it through the week. Our topic today was the immutable smile. What is the immutable <coughs> smile? The God presence within us. The ananda, the bliss that supports us from our depths. No matter what we are going through on the surface. And recollect the story of the arrogant king who asks, who is greater, God or me? And a wise man tells him in order to avoid the king's wrath, you are greater, O king. You can banish anyone from your kingdom at will. But God in his love for his becoming cannot banish anyone. So this story is a metaphor for us the arrogant king is the ego, a surface being, which is quick to make enemies, which is happy to create divides and separations. But the God in us cannot cut anyone off because the God in us recognizes everyone as bits of itself. And that God is always going to be greater than the king despite the wise man's answer. So we may have toxic people in our life but there's some part of us which can never really cut away from them. But our healing comes when we don't feel a need to cut away from them. So long as we have this need we may need to respect it for a while. But knowing deep inside that my real healing comes when I don't need to cut away from them, 
Ignatishwaran beautifully says, bearing resentment towards anyone is more than one impaired relationship. It's breaking your connection with the whole. W-H-O-L-E, whole. Whatever this person has done to you, there's a wisdom in remembering that even if the, that piece of existence has let me down, that human being, the whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole, will never let me down. Just like a pot, the same potter who mercilessly strikes the pot on the surface to give it a beautiful shape, the potter knows the clay. One hand of the potter from inside supports it. So if I remember all this, I can think of that difficult person and just visualize that person's face mutating into the face of the mother or my highest reverence. This too is you. Sri Aurobindo's beautiful words, the most astounding definition of morality, he says true morality is to see the God of beauty and love and good in the ugly and the evil and in that utter love to have a desire to heal the ugliness, maybe not in action, but in prayer, in the will for good inside me. That is real morality, not to criticize the evil and the ugly, but to see the God of love and beauty in the evil and the ugly and in utter love hold a desire to heal it. So keeping all this in mind, I may see the difficult person, that face transforming into the face of the mother. And I send metta to that person for the being in the person, not the form the being takes. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be free. As I send metta, let me drop feeling threatened by this person. Sri Aurobindo's words, God struck me with a human hand. Shall I have the insolence to say, how dare you to God? If it's God who's doing this to me, I'm safe. Because God will not allow this form he inhabits to harm me beyond what's good for my growth. So shedding fear, shedding recoil, feeling completely safe at the thought of this person. Safe in the God that inhabits the person. And one last time, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, may you be free and on your own. And then fold your hands together in a namaste. Take a long, slow inhalation. Breathe out with Om.
subscribe, please don't.